Let's continue on in John's Gospel, this time in chapter 18. Remember this morning we looked at how the uh, section in Luke's Gospel fit into this Gospel between really verses, uh, well, 1, 2, and, and 3, I believe. What I'd like to do is uh, this evening look at verses 1 through 12. Uh, so let's go ahead and begin by reading that, uh, John chapter 18, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus had spoken these words, He went forth with His disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which He entered with His disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying Him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with His disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohorts and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am... They drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore he again asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you seek me, let these go their way to fulfill the word which he spoke. Of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me. Shall I not drink it? So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. We'll stop the, uh, the reading there. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this evening. Now this morning we saw Jesus praying in the garden, praying that he might be sanctified that is, not that he would be purified from sin because he is spotless and blameless, but rather that he might be able, by God's grace, to set aside his will to survive and have the strength that he needed to go to the cross. We saw that Jesus was human like the rest of us. I mean, he is, of course, the eternal Son of God, but becoming a man, he became fully man without giving up his deity. In his humanity, he was fully human. And so he prayed and he asked the Father that if it was possible, that if there was another way the Father could save his people to let that cup of suffering that he was about to drink pass, but the Father showed him there was no other way. Now knowing that this was obviously a struggle for his son, the Father in his mercy sent an angel to Jesus in order to strengthen him, and so Jesus continued to pray. And as Jesus looked forward to the suffering that he was about to endure, and remember it was only a few hours away, as he looked at what he was really going to have to suffer on the cross, that is the furnace of his father's wrath that he knew that he had to go through in order to save his people, he continued to agonize in prayer to the point where Luke tells us he began to sweat blood. His sweat was like thick, clotted blood that was falling to the ground, again Luke giving to us a physician's perspective on Jesus. But we also saw that his wrestling with his father in prayer was successful. He found the strength that he needed and now there's no longer that struggle. We see Jesus sets his face toward the cross and is not going to allow anything to get in his way. Now this is where we usually consider the sufferings of our Lord to begin. But we do need to understand His whole life had actually been such a life. From the time He entered this world as a man into a world of sinful men, as we saw it in terms of His humiliation this morning, all of these things were for the eternal Son of God, leaving, as it were, the courts of heaven coming down by becoming a man and living among sinful men. That was an act of humiliation, but it was also an act of suffering. Jesus suffered living here, being as holy as He was. Remember how Lot, when he was in Sodom, 
how uh, Peter tells us that his soul was afflicted by the wickedness that was going on around him. Well, if that was true of Lot, how much more of the Son of God who loved righteousness perfectly. His sufferings began when he came into the world and certainly as he began his ministry in bringing the gospel to them and suffering the, again, the insults and the blasphemies, his sufferings continued. But here begin the events that lead to his final sufferings. Here he gives himself over willingly into the hands of his enemies to suffer on the cross, to suffer the wrath of God and to die for us. Now this evening, I do want us to consider that Jesus willingly gave himself over, and we see that in many different ways, but I want us to consider five things from our text, most of which deal with that particular theme. First of all, Jesus' foreknowledge of his betrayal and arrest. He went to the garden knowing he was going to be betrayed. The power that he had to prevent it, and yet he didn't, but gave himself over. His protection of his disciples through it. He intended to give himself, not his disciples, over for this particular uh, work. His correction, again, of Peter who tried to stop him from, or at least to stop this process of his arrest. And then finally, his arrest that he submits to willingly. So first of all, we see Jesus' foreknowledge, that he went to the garden knowing full well that he would be betrayed and arrested there. John writes in verses 1 through 4, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? Now we noted this this morning, that Jesus came to Gethsemane in order to pray with his disciples, because this is where he would customarily go when he was at Jerusalem or near Jerusalem, and that this is also how Judas knew where he would be. And now that Judas had the Roman soldiers, now that he had the, uh, the guards that also came from the Pharisees, he went to the garden to betray Jesus. But Jesus already knew that Judas would betray him that night in that very garden. And he knew what was going to happen through this betrayal. We already saw that in Luke 22 as we saw Jesus wrestling in the garden because he knew what was coming upon him. And yet, knowing all these things, knowing that Judas would be there, knowing that he was going to be betrayed and arrested and what he had to face, he still came to the garden. Now, usually when you know that there is danger ahead of you, you do everything you can to avoid that danger. But Jesus, knowing beforehand what was ahead of him, didn't avoid it. And he didn't, obviously, because he intended to hand himself over for us. If Jesus did not give himself over, if he didn't give himself up, if he didn't go willingly to the cross, if he didn't suffer what he suffered on the cross, he could not have saved us. And so he must give himself up. He must be there. He must be arrested. And so Jesus went. Now, secondly, we see Jesus' power to prevent this arrest. John writes in verses 4 through 6, So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am, or I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with him. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, notice, first of all, that Jesus here was not trying to hide his identity. He told them plainly who he was because he had come there to be betrayed into their hands. And I want you to notice also the way that Jesus answered them and the way that I read it the first time through. He said to them, you know, he says, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said, I am. 
Now, we saw earlier that when he said this to the Jews, they picked up stones to stone him. Because by saying that he is, I am, he was basically claiming to be the covenant God of Israel because I am is his name. That's literally what Yahweh means. Now, the Romans likely didn't understand this, but the Jews certainly understood. But I do think that Jesus gave here an object lesson both to the Roman soldiers and to the Jews who were present. When Jesus said, I am, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Now, what is it that, that actually happened here? What is it that Jesus did to them? Well, Pentecostalism, as you know, has historically used this verse to prove, at least in their own thinking, of what they call being slain in the Spirit is actually a teaching of the Bible. They believe that this is simply an act of God's power to show us how powerful He is and that He does it for benevolent purposes. Uh, God may cause you to pass out. He may, as it were, cause you to fall over to indicate that He's doing something special in your life. As a matter of fact, I actually came out of a background like that, and I saw that happening all the time. Never actually experienced it myself, but yes, it is very much held to and believed. And they look at this passage as the justification for that kind of practice. Now, it is interesting that this kind of thing has happened only twice in the Bible. And you might think I was going to say once, but it actually did happen twice. And each time it happened, Jesus did this not to his friends, not to his people, not to those whom he loved, but rather he did it to his enemies. And in the second case, <coughs> excuse me, he did actually convert somebody uh, into a child of God. So you might say in a certain sense, yes, Jesus did love him in advance. Now, Jesus was not here laying down a practice or a basis for a new practice in his church, but he was showing his enemies who he was and the power that he actually had at his disposal to prevent them from doing whatever it is they may have planned to do. Now again, that other example I told you about is Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, when Jesus knocked him off his horse to show Saul who he was as he was on his way to Damascus to arrest and imprison his people, that is the Lord's people, and all that he might find there that call upon the name of Jesus Christ. He also showed Saul uh, his power and his ability to stop him. Now, we do need to recognize there were several things that Jesus could have done if he had wanted to avoid capture, if, if he wanted to prevent them from taking him away. He could have simply knocked them all down and, and left. I mean, he had the power to do that. He could have walked right through them as he did on one occasion where, remember, he went to the synagogue and he read that passage and he says, today this, this passage is fulfilled in your hearing. The one about Isaiah talking about the Messiah and they were wondering about these words, gracious words falling from his lips and then he identified himself as the Messiah. They took him to the edge of a cliff and they were going to throw him over. But then suddenly he just simply walked through the midst of them and, and left and nobody tried to stop him. Jesus could have done that on this occasion. Uh, Jesus being God and the one the author to the Hebrews tells us is really holding everything up in, in existence and in being could have simply let go of them and they would have vanished into thin air. Or as we know from the other gospel writers, Jesus could have called down 12 legions of angels immediately to come to his aid and you know how strong angels are. One of them destroyed 185,000 Assyrians. Uh, in one evening. But you see, Jesus didn't do any of these things. He allowed them instead to arrest him. Now, Jesus had the power to prevent this, but he didn't do this because he was giving himself over so that through his death on the cross, he might actually save us, that you and I could go free. And again, this is our Lord's love for us, as we saw this morning. Now, thirdly, we see Jesus' protection of his disciples. Jesus was giving himself over to them. He was not giving them his disciples. Now, we read in verses 7 through 9. Therefore, he again asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. 
So if you seek me, let these go their way to fulfill the word which he spoke of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. Now Jesus in his high priestly prayer, as you'll recall, prayed that the Father would protect those whom he had given to him because Jesus was about to leave and return to heaven and that he prayed that the Father would protect them while they're on earth. But Jesus hasn't yet gone. Jesus is still here. And while he is on earth, it was still his job to do. Jesus, as I said, was intending to hand himself over so that he might save his disciples, so that he might deliver them from, from hell. But in so doing, it wasn't his intention to hand them over, that they might be uh, put to death. You know, as I, as I read this and thinking about how Jesus did this, it reminded me of, 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 perhaps you'll excuse me for this illustration from an old movie that I saw one time, a moving scene from a movie called Spartacus. Maybe some of you have seen that. It was at the very end of the movie. Uh, Spartacus was a gladiator who basically freed himself and the other gladiators, and he led this rebellion, as it were, against Rome. But eventually the Roman army put them down and captured them. And when Spartacus and all his men had been captured, the Romans didn't know. they had never actually seen Spartacus. They didn't know what he looked like. And so they demanded from their captives that if Spartacus was still alive, that they expose him. But by this time, these men who had followed Spartacus, they, their love and their admiration for their leader had grown so much that just as Spartacus was about to speak up in order that he might spare them, one of his men steps forward and declares, I am Spartacus. And as soon as he steps forward, another steps up and says, no, I'm Spartacus. And then another and another until all of them are crying out that they are all Spartacus. And as a result of this, they are all crucified along with Spartacus. So they all tried to protect their leader. And in so doing, they all died with him. But that is not what Jesus allowed to happen because of what Jesus had promised, because of what Jesus uh, had, had promised his Father, of all you have given to me, I have lost not even one. Now, it's not that the disciples didn't love Jesus. They certainly loved Jesus, but Jesus loved them more. And Jesus still had a purpose for them in, in, his, in his kingdom while they're on earth to extend his kingdom. And so Jesus steps up right away and identifies himself, tells the soldiers who he was, and adding that if, if he was the one they were after, then they should let these others go. Again, to fulfill what we read in verse 9 and what Jesus prayed just shortly ago. Of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. Except, of course, for the son of perdition, uh, Judas, the one who was betraying him. Now, Jesus protected his disciples by standing up for them and by handing himself over to them. And basically, in protecting his disciples in this way, he also has protected us because he handed himself over to the Romans and to the Jewish guards in order to save us. And now that he has saved us, the Lord tells us that he will not allow anything in heaven or earth or under the earth to harm us or to separate us from his love. So Jesus protected not only his disciples who were present then, but he has protected them for all time by handing himself over in order to be crucified. Now, fourthly, we see Jesus' correction of Peter, who again tries to stop him from doing what it is the Lord called him to do. John writes in verses 10 and 11, Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Now, I think we see here that, that either Peter was not very good with the sword, maybe he was trying to kill the guy and he only ended up getting a piece of him, or maybe he was trying to follow Jesus' instruction, love your neighbor as yourself, and he didn't really want to kill him, he just wanted to injure him somewhat as a warning to kind of back off. But one thing we do understand is that Peter had good intentions, but good intentions aren't enough. You need to understand what God's will is and do it. 
Peter had good intentions earlier in Jesus' ministry, remember? When Jesus had told his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, there he will be betrayed, there he will die. Peter says in Matthew 16, verse 22, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And remember what Jesus then said to him, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. I mean, just think about those words and how often do we do that exact thing. Now, Peter tried to stop Jesus from going to Jerusalem, and here Jesus has to reprove him again because Peter is again getting in the way of what it is that Jesus had to do. He didn't want Peter or his disciples to prevent what was going to happen. I mean, Jesus could have prevented it, but he didn't. He didn't want the disciples to step in the, the way either and to fight for him. This was not the way that the kingdom was going to come. He wanted to die for them. It was through his death and his resurrection that God's purpose was actually going to be fulfilled, and Peter was again getting in the way. Now remember, Peter had a different idea of what Jesus came to do. He shared, he shared that same thinking that many of the Jews shared that Messiah had come to deliver the Jews from the power of the Romans and restore the kingdom to Israel, so Peter was ready to fight. But again, Peter was mistaken, as he had been before. And let me just mention, that even after Jesus is betrayed and crucified, dead and raised again from the dead, before, just on that day, before he ascends into heaven, the disciples again ask him, Lord, is it now you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you finally going to do it? And Jesus doesn't say it's going to happen this way. He, he basically tells them again, it's not for you to know the time, but you're going to receive power. Um, this was not the way the kingdom was going to come. And so Jesus corrects Peter again. We read in verse 11, put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? This is the way the kingdom is going to come, Peter. I must drink this cup. Don't fight for me, Peter. I have to go with them and I must die. And though it's not mentioned here, we understand from the other gospels that Jesus also undid the injury that Peter had caused to that servant. We learn in Luke's account that Jesus healed Malchus's ear. By the way, I just want to point out the fact that John is the only evangelist, the only gospel writer who points out the name of this particular servant whose ear was cut off. Everybody else just reports him as the slave of the high priest or the slave that was there. Uh, this shows us that John knew who this was. John had a connection, had some personal connection, personal ties with the priestly court. And we're going to see that later when we see him gain entrance to see what's going on with the trial of Jesus. Now again, Jesus did not allow his disciples to defend him, but willingly gave himself up. He had prayed to his father earlier that if it was possible for this cup to pass, that it would pass, but it wasn't possible, and Jesus, knowing that it wasn't possible, was determined now to drink that cup in order that he might save us. So he says, Peter, put away the sword. Now finally, we see Jesus' arrest. We read in verses 12 and 13. So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him and led him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Well, Jesus was now in their hands, which is exactly where he wanted to be. He gave himself over to those who hated him that they might kill him, just that basically the Lamb of God might be led to the slaughter, as we read in Isaiah 53. Now, Jesus knew this was his father's will, Jesus knew that this is what he came into the world to do. Jesus knew that this had to be done in order to save us and that he was the only one who could actually do this. And so he willingly gave himself over into their hands that they might do to him what the Father had planned. Now this is simply the first step towards the fiery furnace 
that Jesus is going to endure for us as He endures hell on the cross. But again, I hope you see this as a grand reminder of the love that Jesus has for all whom the Father has given to Him, for everyone that belongs to Him, and that this is the love that Jesus has for you if you belong to Him this evening, if you've trusted Him alone for your salvation, if you have devoted your life to Him and to His service. Uh, I did include one verse that we're not going to display right now, but Jesus did say in 12 verses 25 and 26, He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So if you have trusted the Lord, if you have devoted your life to the Lord, Jesus has done this for you so that you might one day be with Him. And let me just mention as well that this is the love that He also offers to you if you haven't yet trusted Him. Jesus went to the cross in order to save sinners, and He offers to forgive everyone, anyone who will come to Him and who will receive Him. He offers to forgive you and to save you from what you and, of course, everyone else who has been saved by the Lord, what we justly deserve for our sins. So let me just encourage you again this evening to take him up on this offer because you're not going to find a better offer anywhere. Jesus suffered his Father's wrath so that you would not have to suffer forever if you will only believe and trust Him and devote yourself to His service. Well, again, may the Lord apply His Word to each of us as we need to hear it. Let's, let's bow in a moment of silent prayer and, and let's ask the Lord that He might do that.